As Kevin mentioned, um, Kevin and I were on staff together at Soldatna Bible Chapel for a number of years, and it's been uh, it's been fun to to minister together and to see their family grow, and um, to be involved in in ministry, and uh, to just uh, have such great fellowship together. Kevin's and Donna, Kevin's going to come up and uh, tell us about the ministry that they're going to be joining, or that they already have joined, but they're going to be transitioning to in uh, a few months. Okay, I'll, I'll pray then as we get started. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us to worship you. We thank you for our... Uh, family together at Redeemer. We thank you that that you bring us together to encourage one another in the faith. Thank you that um, we can share the love of Jesus with each other and with others. And we look forward, Father, to hearing about taking the gospel to the rest of the world. And we just ask your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All the tech things figured out here. So, um, again, good to see everyone this morning. Um, we're going to start off with an introduction about ourselves before we go into the ministry so that we get an idea of, of, of who we are and what our history is. Um, again, as you're praying for different people, it's helpful to know who they are and about this. So, um, I was born and raised in northwestern Pennsylvania in a town where there are more deer than people. Um, we, had we still, to this day, in the school district I grew up in, have mandatory hunter safety classes. All sixth graders learn how to shoot a gun. Um, I almost failed it because I'm cross-eyed and I didn't know it until I went to shoot a gun. Um, but we do this and, and my mom is on the school board. She says, as long as I'm on the school board, we're gonna have this program. She's been on the school board for 26 years. She keeps trying to get off of it and they won't let her. Um, again, valuable, valuable servants is, is, a, is a beautiful thing. And that. So we grew up there. I went to college down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, the University of Pittsburgh in the heart of the city. Um, yeah, so um, my dorm was 19 stories tall, and the, cla the, the most famous classroom is 36 stories tall. Um, the, the 37 through 40 stories are controlled by the FBI. They can use the spy on people around different things, and FAA and all sorts of different groups. The rumor was always the FBI. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's fun to say. Um, that's where I met my wife, and, and she'll tell her story uh, a, a little bit. Um, we came forth, uh, came out of there. Um, we got saved uh, after I finished graduate school. Um, I guess I should backtrack. I, I studied chemistry, and where I met my wife in chemistry club, so we're both chemistry nerds. Um, falling in love is just about chemistry. Dumping someone is pure physics, is what we always say. Um, I went to graduate school in Colorado, um, published some papers on um, rare molecules and interaction with one another. So my, if, you, if you dig for my name on papers, you'll find them, but it doesn't mean anything. I, don't forget, I forgot almost of that stuff at the time. Um, so came back, didn't want to do that. Um, went to business school so I could make sure we could support my family. We wanted to have kids. After we finished that, started working, and, and that's, where we, that's where we met the Lord and got saved in a church. Um, two years after that, a um, year and a half after that, we're on the mission field. And we're living in nowhere, Arizona. Um, it was, the hospital was 90 miles away. The Walmart was 91 miles. No, it was closer. It was, it was the, the Walmart was this side of the hospital, was it? So 89 and a half miles to the Walmart. Um, we go and get diapers. Um, we took the five-month-old grandson away from grandma and grandpa, the firstborn grandson on both sides, and we said, we're going to the mission field. <laughs> And they were not happy. But we still followed what the Lord did, and, and the Lord helped us to maintain. Uh, need, a, need a booster. There we go. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, so after, again, we were at this boarding school. Um, boarding school is basically, you know, in, basically your school and, uh, and you're just out in the middle of nowhere and the kids come in. We would board, kindergartners would come in. They would bring five-year-old kids and drop them off at the school. Um, a lot of them were malnourished when they came to the school. They couldn't feed them. A lot of them were high on drugs when they came in um, from the drug use in the home. Uh, we minister them. We would feed them. We would give them education. We'd give them the gospel. And I was hired to be the finance director, and they said, we want you to stay and do the finances. You don't have to teach a class. We just want you to stay put. And they kept that promise for 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. The third day, I'm teaching geometry to eighth graders. I'm like, I don't know anything I'm doing, but... Okay, Lord, there's only one answer when the Lord calls. It's yes, Lord. And so we, we did that, and I said, <clears throat> Lord, I'll do anything. I was long enough to preach. Well, that happened in the fall. Um, I became the backup chapel speaker. We had daily chapel. And if my boss, who was the chaplain, was busy because he's administrative of the whole campus, then I was up. So every day I'd prep a message because I knew most days that I'm not, I was going to be the chapel speaker. That morphed one thing led to another, and I ended up leave, going over to be a full-time chaplain, um, we do four services on Sunday mornings with the kids, um, two services Wednesday night, and then I taught high school Bible classes along the way, in addition to counseling and other Sunday stuff. Uh, we were there for six and a half years, or, or young, um, and then as we went along from there, we moved to Alaska, a day school called Cookland Academy. Um, uh, it was founded 30 years before. We were there for four years, and we moved over to the Bible Chapel. I've been there for 14 years. My last day on staff at the Bible Chapel will be the end of April. This year, we, because of COVID complications, we've we're been doing, working full-time at the Bible Chapel while raising support. Um, while, we're on, while I've been there, I've, I've been mission trips to different places. I've been to China, um, it's, uh, called Kunming, China, a small city of four million people. Um, not on those maps, which just blows the mind, four million people, a small city. Um, did underground church work in that, in that area. I've been to India a number of times. Took my son, older son to India. And, and did work back in, out in the, in the boonies of India. I've uh, been in the boonies of Haiti, so every time I go somewhere, I go out in the sticks. I'm working with, uh, called Business as Mission, BAM work, um, helping missionary, missionaries thrive and finding alternative sources of income. Um, different Alaskan villages. Um, again, in Alaska, there's two, there are two Alaskas. There's the road system where people can drive there or take a boat there, and then there's the villages isolated you can only fly in and out of. And those villages are, are dark places, just flat out dark places. And we've been there, my kids have been there ministering as well. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, some themes that have developed were teaching, mentoring, administration, and missions have, have been themes in my life. As I say, I'm an odd shaped key. <laughs> my ministry gifts are odd shaped, but there's a lot of odd shaped locks out there that need some odd shaped ministries, and so that's what we're called to do. And so my wife, Donna, who's a gifted Bible teacher and of herself, she's going to come up and talk about the kids and about her testimony as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it on? Mm. Now it's on. Hello, everybody. I'm Donna, and this is our family. Um, we have on the right is our oldest, Nathan, and he married an older woman by one day. <laughs> so her day, her birthday is on the 4th of November and his is the 5th of November. And they will be married three years in May. They met at college and uh, she is just beautiful on the outside, but so much more on the inside. She's just a strong woman for the Lord and we just couldn't be more, more pleased and more blessed to have her as part of our family. They have their dog Posey in the picture, but what's not in the picture is our grandson who is uh, going to be um, showing him his face to the world sometime in May. So we're very excited to be grandparents and uh, just excited to see the Lord working in them and in their lives. Um, we, uh, our other two children are flanking us in the picture on the left. Caleb is the one, the, the bearded man, and he is uh, 21, Nathan is 24. And uh, he is a junior at College of the Ozarks, and he's majoring in uh, recreational management with a history minor and uh, an accounting um, dual major. And uh, he wants to either be a, a, a college athletic director or run a 
Bible camp, a summer Bible camp or year-round camp. He just loves the outdoors, so I really see him doing probably the camp. And he has a serious girlfriend, so we'll see how that goes in the next, I don't know, year or two. And then we have Rachel. Rachel's our 19-year-old, and she is a freshman at College of the Ozarks. And she is looking into maybe a CPA, so she's doing accounting and uh, business right now. They are all very unique, just like how all of us are. The Lord has made us all uh, intertwined us together so so neatly together and it's just it, it has been cool to watch them and to raise them up and we've always been under the the we've always taken the Lord's direction that everything we're doing is to raise them so that they can be out in the world and making a difference in the world so um, even though we're empty nesters it doesn't we're, we're not uh, sitting at home around the, the table and crying that they're out in the world and stuff so uh, it's just exciting to, to see them move, and, and the Lord has definitely blessed us. Um, a little bit about myself, so I'm just jumping backwards. I grew up uh, south of Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Kevin and I met in college. But when I was growing up, I was a Sunday Christian, and I didn't realize that. I went to church, mainline church. Our family would go, and we would go and do our hour time, Sometimes if my dad got us there on time, we would be dropped off for Sunday school beforehand, and then we just went about the rest of our week. We, we were good people. We didn't, um, you know, swear or party or live lives that would be uh, shameful in anybody's eyes. And so I thought I was okay. Um, in high school, I joined the um, Campus Life group that would meet with with uh, local students in high school, and there was like five or six different high schools that would get together, and, and that was a good foundation to see, oh, there really are other Christians that are my age. And we went to a week-long, a weekend camp in Ohio, and it was there that I really heard the gospel message for the first time. I knew the Bible stories. Uh, I had all the head knowledge. I could answer all the questions right in Sunday school, but that was the first time that I really heard that the Lord wanted a personal relationship with me, and he created us to have relationships, and uh, number one should be our relationship with him, and um, so I was just starting to understand that, and it wasn't really until after we got married how he was saying I was actually pregnant with with Nathan when we got saved so that was 25 years ago and I was thinking this morning um, I'm 51 so I was like wow I'm I just went over half of my life of not being a Christian being a Christian and what a difference it has been to be a uh, to be walking with the Lord and to be his child uh, in college when we met and stuff we both thought that we were marrying Christians and and um, it wasn't really until the Spirit called us and, and awakened us to saying, hey, you need to have that personal relationship. We want you to be in God's Word every, every day and be praying and having commun communion and a relationship with the Lord. And when, when we did that, uh, we really saw all the connections, all the dots that we had just really started coming together. And uh, immediately, uh, Kevin felt led to, to get into to missions. In the, and he goes, do you feel a change coming on? I feel the Lord leading us. And I said, yes, I feel a change coming on. I'm getting bigger every day, and we're going to have a family. I was like more focused on that at first, but him being the spiritual leader, leader of the house, the Lord was speaking to him first. And uh, it was only maybe about three months afterwards I started saying, yeah, I see the Lord directing us somewhere. And so that's how we went to Arizona, how he talked about that and everything. So I'm just, everywhere that we've gone to uh, share the gospel with others, I have not been there first. The Lord has laid it on our hearts to go. Kevin's went and checked it out when he went when, to Arizona. It was a small boarding school. They couldn't, you know, afford to fly both of us out. And so I I've been to Arizona, and I, I love the heat and everything, so I was excited to go, but I'm just like, okay, God's telling me to go, Kevin's telling me to go, and that's where we're going to go. When we went to Alaska, it was one of the darkest times of the year where they don't have too much uh, daylight in the, in the winter, and he took a disposable camera with him and took pictures. It was this cloudy, depressing-looking <laughs> set of pictures that came back, and he said, even if I don't get the position, 
with the Cook Inlet Academy where, uh, where we moved up to, he goes, I really want to go back. The people are so dear and so genuine. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going from the desert and the heat that I like to the cold, but you, that's where you want me to be, so you'll give me peace. Uh, Minnesota, that's not exactly where I want to be either, but that's, I'm thinking that's, you know, two times now the Lord has directed me, and it's been fun. And, and I've grown through those times where uh, he's led me, and so I'm just excited to see uh, everything. When Kevin's going to explain a little bit more about what he's doing, I'm going to continue being what I have been to him for um, almost, we're going to be celebrating our 29 years of being his help meet. So I am going to help him in the ministry that way, making sure that he's packed and ready to go, but he does a great job with that anyways. And um, on the trips and supporting him that way, just like I supported him when he was uh, uh, pastoring a church and just doing anything that he needs. And I also am going to be the, the connection with the support, our support team, keeping everybody updated on what's going on uh, when there's prayer concerns and needs and everything like that. So that's going to be my hand in the, in the missions. But I'll turn it back over to him. Thank you. Problem. Our pulpits are sold out to the false teachers, to the guy who performing signs and wonders every Sunday. Churches that give their pulpits, if it performs the miracles, they just invite him in. Um, that's the status of the church in Ethiopia and many other places around the world as well. Um, there's a workshop in Cameroon, um, <clears throat> and they're doing this workshop, and they had lunch, and they asked, the guy lunch says, all right, how do you honor your elders in your culture? Because that's an important thing in their culture. How do you honor your elders? And it's, it was a good question. And the one pastor says, um, we dig up their bones out of the graveyard and portray them around town <laughs> to show them honor that way. And he goes, okay, is that in the Bible? He goes, yes. Where? <clears throat> you know, and they took up Joseph's bones when they left Egypt and they paraded him to the promised land where they buried him. The, the, again, in the Bible, Joseph said, take me to the promised land, my bones there, I want them to be buried. And they thought if they did that, that would be honoring their elders. Okay. And, and we kind of grimace at that and laugh at that. You know why? Because we know that's not what that text means but they don't know that the pastor didn't know that he's reading the bible he's trying to be faithful to the scripture as he understands it but sometimes our understanding goes a little bit askew and so that's the problem there isn't enough bible base so when a false teacher comes in with the prosperity gospel or or mixing with ananism or mixing with synchronism with with islam they don't understand and there's no basis to stand firm and so they're asking, these national churches are asking for help. So some questions. Because I'm a teacher, we like quizzes. Okay. How many people every day are getting saved, becoming Christians around the world? And the answer is 174,000 people every day are getting saved. That means every eight days? McAllen, the population of McAllen is becoming Christians every eight days or so. Okay. Now, some Christians are dying and, and other that, so the null number isn't growing that high, but every day people are being saved around the world. That's an, again, every day. And if some of you are going to do the math, you're going to say, how many of this per minute? But I don't, I'm not going to wait for that. What percentage of Christians live outside North America and Europe? Sensing a theme here, we're going with D, 67%. And that number is probably conservative. I would say it's more closer to 75, if not 80% at this point in time. Most of the believers are outside Africa, Asia, the gospel is exploding in, in, in impact, impact in, those, in those parts of the world right now. Question three, how many evangelical churches exist around the world? Any guesses? Uh, we have someone sensing the pattern with D, and the answer is D. 22 million churches. 22 million churches around the globe. Is that a good thing? Yes. However, problem. What percentage of evangelical pastors outside the U.S. have no theological education? 
D, you're quick. I like you. You're quick. 85%. 85% of pastors, 17 out of every 20 pastors have no training in the gospel at all. No training whatsoever. Right. Question five. If every seminary in the world operated 120% capacity, what percentage of needed leaders would be trained? I'll give you a hint. It's not D. 10%. There's enough seminary training slots to happen. And, and as a side note, you know, one of the ways to train pastors is to bring them to Europe or bring them to the United States, bring them to another culture. Of the pastors brought to the United States to train up for the ministry, between one half and two thirds of them don't go back home. They stay, in the, they stay in the country and don't go back home. And okay, we understand that. We understand that. And that's what's happening. So. According to the church leaders in the non-Western world, what is the number one lead? And the number one need is leadership training. How do we train leaders? How do we teach these churches how to stand firm? Because they're being assaulted on every side. They're being assaulted on every side. Um, again, the number one church export from the United States is the prosperity gospel. Um, the, idea, the idea is that you know, the stuff you see on TV, I mean, we actually went to Houston, we drove by and said, oh look, there's Lakewood Church. I didn't know it was on this route. I should have gone another way. I didn't want to be that close to it. But that's on TBN, right? And it's not, it doesn't stop at the borders. With the internet, it goes everywhere. Kenneth Copeland, it goes everywhere. And it's very, in Africa, it's very much a big thing. If you are having trouble feeding your family, you need medicine, and someone says this offer, and you don't know any better, wouldn't you jump on it? And then they crash and they burn. As, and, and this one believer in Nigeria says, I don't want to deal with Christians. I've done that before. I know what they promise. I don't want that. And the gospel is just that much further away from them. No. You know, you're just offering food. You just, no, no. How do we get in and invest with these people? No. How do we get in and invest with these people? What can we do this? You know, that's where the need is greatest. You know, should I go there? Should I be good? except that my blue eyes get in the way. Um, last time I was in India, I was on a flight, <clears throat> and I, boarded, I was in the back of the plane, and I sat down as a domestic flight, and you stood up to go, and in India, everyone stands up at the same time and rushes out the front as fast as you can go. Um, it's different. So I, I waited to the bye, and I stood up, and literally, I could see over top of everyone's head all the way to the front of the plane, and to the pilot. And I stick out like a sore thumb in India. I really do. That's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a thing. It just is. So can I relate to the people on their, on their level? It's much more difficult. It's much more difficult. It, it, just, it just is. So how can we do this? The best way to do this is training up leaders. Leadership development is the crucial bottleneck to church growth. There's a worldwide shortage of, of men and again, this is, this is from a, um, not an evangelical site, but it's it, it true holds, of men and women truly called of God and deeply taught in the scriptures to lead the churches. People willing to suffer the burdens and responsibilities of leadership for the sake of the Savior who redeemed them. In many contexts, this means deprivation, scorn, and even risk of death. Those who accurately and effectively expound the scriptures are few, especially in areas where churches are growing rapidly. New methods and means of multiplying well-trained, godly, effective leaders must be developed. Traditional methods alone will not, be suf will not suffice to produce the number and equality needed to meet the need. Pastors, ministers, and elders all need to be constant upholding these in prayer. And so that's why our organization was found, Training Leaders International, to do one thing, to strengthen local churches worldwide by equipping church leaders through theological training. <clears throat> The best thing I can do is not train you. I can train your pastor so he can train you. And then he can train other pastors and they can train more and more and more and more. And I was talking this morning about Ghana. You know, I'm so excited because Ghana says, we don't need you to come anymore. We've been trained enough. We can do it without your help. That's a huge win. What does that mean? That church is growing, self-sustaining. And now guess what? They can send out missionaries to their neighboring countries and the gospel is spread that way. The goal is to never go back as a teacher. 
go back as friends and, and invited, that's a different thing. The goal is to never go back, not to be dependent upon us, but to equip them and send them off. Um, we talk about that with our children all the time. The, the psalmist said children is like an arrows in a quiver. Are arrows meant to stay in the quiver? You take them what? You take them out and you send them off. That's the purpose of arrows. And, and as I know sometimes parents forget that. You know, we were blessed. We were very blessed when our kids were very, very little that we were teaching high schoolers. Um, and we could see this behavior and going, I don't like that in that person. I don't want this in this, my own kid. And so we, we, were, we instinctively started training our kids up to be 18. The, the goal was 18. When they're out of the house, are they equipped? Are they ready to go? Are they ready to do these kind of things? Yeah. Now they're 19 and I'm lost. I have no idea what to do now. But we got them that far. Um, the same idea here. We want to equip people to send them out to do the work of the Lord. Send it out and, and let the seed scatter. Mix all sorts of metaphors with that. That's what we're called to do. So how are we going to do this? First of all, we're going to send short-term ministry teams which teaches a core curriculum over three years. Basically, the curriculum is one thing. It's hermeneutics. How to study the scriptures. How to study the scriptures in context. Again, when I gave the message this morning, I made sure to outline the book of Philippians. Why? Because you need to know that I'm taking it in context. I'm not taking it and ripping it out of context and making it mean something that it doesn't. You need to have confidence in that. And so we're going to do this. Are there all sorts of verses we can take out of context? Yes. Does the Bible say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die? Does the Bible say that? Yes. Three different places. All is a negative. <laughs> Money is the root of all evil. Does the Bible say that? Technically, yes. If you chop off the prepositional phrase, love of, and drop that off, you do that. But again, that's doing disservice to the English language. Making an object of a preposition the subject of a sentence is doing disservice to the language. And all the English teachers go and preach, right? <laughs> But that's what we have to do. Then you've heard money is root of all sorts of evil. They take it out of context. We don't want to do this. So we're training them in context. The way it works is we have three, we go three times a year for three years, nine different classes. First one is about orienting to scripture. And then we start working through the different genres. Okay, the gospels. And we're not gonna give an overview of the gospel. We're gonna say, okay, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, let's start. What do these words mean? And we leave through, oh, by the way, here talking about salvation. What does that mean? Boom. By the way, here talking about ecclesiology, about the church. What does that mean? Boom. And as you're studying, all these themes come out of Scripture, and you address them on the point. And maybe we get through four chapters, maybe we get through 12 chapters, however far we get, then they have homework, and they apply that to the other Gospels as well. They come back in four months to do this. And by the way, we've moved on, and now we're doing the wisdom books. <laughs> here's the psalms here's the proverbs and all this kind of stuff and so we give them an overview of scripture in a period of three years there's a lot of homework involved with that a lot of building up and this is all under the guise of national churches we don't go in unless we're invited if we're invited into a country we're invited into a place we'll go and teach again i told you about the um the young the gentleman from chile who has a haitian church he's going will you please come help us help me help equip these people we've had in 2020 there were seven different places that asked for help seven different national groups asked for help we can do maybe two maybe three if we can, if we leave out ethiopia because of the civil war going on in ethiopia and the whole country is shut down entirely maybe those people can go to a third country there's just a demand for doing this for teachers in this way it's short term they don't have to leave their work they don't have to leave their family they can stay and go away they just have to take a short period of time away and they're equipped that way okay uh, we want to have longer term missionaries who work with partner churches and schools some of the best ones they'll go to seminary like this young man who came he studied in the thing and in vietnam and he went to the seminary in hanoi and he wanted to be an evangelist and he realized i can't do this i have to go back to my villages to my people group because i'm the only one who knows the scriptures i need to train my people in the scriptures so that they can be effective the church and so we have teachers in these places around the globe. To start schools in underserved regions where theological education is needed. If a national group wants to start a, a, a seminary, we'll come alongside them and do that as well. Again, the goal is to be, phase ourselves out of work. To assist national leaders as they plant local churches. Um, again, if they ask for help, we'll give that unlimited in those situations, but not so much. And the last one, to work with leaders both domestically and internationally reach many migrant diaspora members around the globe, especially in the EU. By some estimates, there's over a million Muslims in Greece now. 
They're escaping the Middle East. They want to get to Europe, where the, po- the closest point of entry is Greece. So they get on boats. You, f- you remember seeing the Haitians come? When I was younger, you see the Haitian boats, the Cuban boat. They do the same thing now in the Aegean Sea. They come across and, and do that, and they're trying to get to the EU. There, there are all sorts of people, t- intake centers, and there's gospel missions popping up all over there because we're trying to equip the people to reach those migrants because it's a great place to do it. Another place that's happening is in southern Italy, in, S- in Sicily. Instead of the Middle East, they're coming from North Africa and trying to come across the Mediterranean. So how do we reach these people? Okay. Okay. There's another big one in West Des Moines, Iowa. Why? Any Iowa people here can tell me? Meatpacking plants, right? Who works in meatpacking plants? And there's churches there. Um, the Somali population in Minnesota. There's, there's a Vietnamese population in Seattle. Um, we're starting up a group reaching... Um, um, Samoans in Honolulu so I might be forced to travel to Honolulu for the Lord's work <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna twist my arm to do that especially in the winter time um, that's what we're doing so the Lord's doing all these different things and we're coming alongside and the opportunities keep growing and growing and growing um, this is a map of locations we're serving um, again the, you can see Greece is not on there we've just opened an office in Greece Argentina is not in there. We opened an office in Buenos Aires, a, a, a site in Buenos Aires. An office is probably the wrong word. These are all locations where we're teaching different leaders the gospel, teaching them about hermeneutics. Um, the one in the Middle East is no longer there. I found out that Middle Eastern people don't go to, to Qatar because they're considered, um, you're going to the West and you're going to go for debauchery in that part of the world. So we actually have another Middle Eastern country where we go to and pastors from Iran and Iraq and other places get there as well. And so we train them for two weeks there and then we go our separate ways. Um, we, we can't go into Iran, but they can come to us if we go to other countries um, in the Middle East and we'll leave those countries nameless for security reasons, obviously. Um, so these, this is what the Lord is doing, is doing through the ministry. Okay? Now, my job is going to be the director of short-term missions. All those two-week mission trips going on, um, about 45 to 50 of those go on pre-COVID. Um, hopefully afterwards with the expansion going on, we'll have 50 to 60 trips going on. So I'm going to go on two to three short-term trips annually, probably never the same place twice. Mongo- I'll go to Mongolia, hopefully in the summer, um, and go to, go to um, Mozambique perhaps, or to Brazil, different places around the globe to teach teams new training locations. Hey, go check out that place in Chile and see if it's something we can do. Um, maintain oversight of the other 45 to 50 trips around, structure theological soundness and quality control. Um, again, I had a two hour theological interview before I was hired and said, what do you believe about these things? So, and a um, little small town trivia, they never did a background check on me officially. Joost, who is Dutch, who now works in Greece, was a pastor in Spokane. And he had a friend, of, a friend of his lives in our town and we do ministry together. So he called him He called him and said, hey, do you know this Kevin guy? He goes, oh yeah, I know him. And he talked, he said, okay, we're gonna hire him now. You were, the, you were the background check. You know, you say give a reference. No, they found a reference without me knowing about it. And the next day we're going out to eat in a restaurant. Hey, my friend Yost called about you. He's gonna hire you and do this other kind of stuff. That's what he told me. And then two days later, Yost called us. So was, again, that's how the Lord works, isn't it? It's kind of funny. Um, Represent TLI in recruiting short-term teachers for these different domestic trips a year. And then one of our goals is to be an asset here. Um, again, we're hoping to partner with Redeemer to go forth and, and be, a, uh, be one of your supported missionaries. We want to be an asset to you. Uh, we want to come back to you. Um, and we're your hands and feet to the world in that sense. But also say, here's what's going on. We want to, we want to over-communicate. Um, I've sat in missions meetings for 14 years. Let, let's, let me back up. So when, when COVID hit and we stopped our services, we started going online services for the morning and we would have evening services. And what I decided to do was, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Zoom these missionaries around the world and talk to them because one of our missionaries was in, is in Italy and, and he was in Milan at the heart of the, remember the initial COVID crisis broke out in Europe was in Milan. He was there. And when Samaritan's Purse brought in the, the, um, the hospital, he was the chaplain. They hired him to be the chaplain. And we have a Samaritan's Purse office in our town. So again, these names are all rubbed together. You know, they connected us, we connected them, you know, so these, these Jay-Z chains that way. 
And so I said, what's going on? So, so we, set up a, we set up a phone meeting with his wife and his son, who we were, were supportive missionaries, and we had an interview. We interviewed him for 20 minutes, and we showed it on video. And then the next week, I called someone else, and we just did this. And I eventually got down to these names on the list going, I don't know these people. These are supportive missionaries that I don't know. And I'm a pastor on staff. I think I should know some of these guys, but I don't know them. And I said, I don't want to be the person that you don't know. <laughs> no, I want to be the one that said, hey, I'm taking the video at the Minneapolis airport. I'm heading for Togo. Please pray. We're gonna, and I'll come back, and then I'm going to put a video together and send you, here's what the Lord's doing with these kind of things. We want to be on your prayer list. We want to be on your prayer list. We're on the prayer list of other churches, and it's a blessing and an honor to pray for other churches. We want to be part, you know, part of you in that sense. So that, that's our goal for this. We have 10 to 12 international trainers located in, uh, in Minneapolis and around the globe. So in order to effectively work with everybody, we have to go work in the main office in Minnesota. So we'll be based in Minneapolis. I don't know where we're gonna live in, in the area because again, they have an, their large mass transit system. Um, we've talked about it is, is we think the best use for spreading the gospel for my wife is to actually find employment, part-time employment somewhere else because I believe Christians get in the bubble. Christians get in the bubble. It's easy to isolate yourself around other Christians when you're in ministry and you don't see anybody else so when you get out of the bubble. And that's, when I talk about refereeing, that's why I do it because I talk to non-Christians that way, coaches, other referees. I mean, how many, you know, the locker room, the referee locker room, it uses a lot of colorful, colorful metaphors, as they say. Um, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. These are the people I'm trying to reach. So we want to do that with her as well. We want to be an asset to our local church we're going to be part of as well and do these areas. That's what we're called to do. Um, again, it's no secret that Christ Church is not good health in many places around the world. She's been languishing because she has been fed, as the current line has it, junk food. All kind of artificial preservatives and all sorts of unnatural substitutes have been served up to her. As a result, theological and biblical malnutrition has affected the very generation that has taken some giant steps to make sure its physical health is not damaged, using foods or products that are harmful to their bodies. And all God's people have said that. Amen. Simultaneously, a worldwide spiritual famine resulting from the absence of any genuine publication of the Word of God continues to run wild and almost unabated in most quarters of the church. And then John Piper says, I love the goal of international Christ-exalting theological famine relief. The way God has raised up TLI to meet this need with real live, spirit-filled human teachers on the ground, face to faith, with seasoned and emerging pastors and Christian leaders who have little or no opportunity for in-depth theological training. So thank God for Darren Carlson, who is our leader, and the amazing ministry God has gathered around the vision. May the word of the Lord run and be glorified. Um, side note to that, to, to preempt a question, yes, we're gonna do some Zoom meetings, but the technology isn't in place in many places to do Zoom meetings. And they, the leaders in the national church want relationships and want it to be reproducible. We want to go and teach them and give them some materials that they can reproduce, and they can't do that by Zoom. So we need to go there and give them materials and walk through it with them to do that. So will we do some Zoom meetings in the future? Yes. But right now, the plan is the bulk of the training is still going to be done in person as much as possible. Okay. So, okay, we're looking for prayer support from everyone. Everyone in the room, we want you to pray for us. <laughs> That's the many. Um, in the back, we have a sign-up sheet. We have a prayer card. We'd love you to take a prayer card. Be on our mailing list. We'll send you an email talking about what's going on. And then we're going to send a newsletter out eight times a year. We'll give you updates about what's going on. I'll give more information about the updates from Ghana in the next newsletter, which is due out, ooh, Thursday. Guess what I'm doing on the flight home? I'm writing a newsletter. Um, so we're going we're to do this. Um, some of you, are, we, we'd like to, some of you would be called to support us financially. We're asking the church to do that. If you feel led to do that, we'd love to talk to you more about that. As of the end of February, we're 70, 75% of our goal. We have to raise all of our living expenses, all of our travel expenses, all of our ministry expenses, plus overhead every month. Uh, so that's what we're raising funds towards. And then a few, some who are educated, seminary trained as such, can be short-term teachers. So it'd be fun to take some people from here and go somewhere else and do it as a team. That would be awesome. So, again, in a nutshell, that's our ministry. We have time for a couple questions. Any questions anyone has? Work the classroom here. Any questions? I put you to sleep, didn't I? Do you, uh, do you, do you teach via a translator? 
the question is, do we teach via translator? The answer is yes. And some of these Zoom meetings we've been having is to educate our translators more about the ministry so they're better able to translate on the fly. The more familiar they are with the material, the easier it is for them to translate. So that's when someone we've been doing over COVID, working with our, with our connections in various countries. Going once. The question is, when will we be established in Minneapolis? Our last day on staff at the Bible Chapel is the last day of April. We were going to leave shortly after that, but our younger son decided he's bringing a serious girlfriend to visit us in Alaska, and so we don't want to leave before that. And they haven't established an ending date to that. So once they decide when she's leaving, then we can decide when we're leaving too. But we're kind of held hostage there for that. In a good way. I mean, we're ex- we've met the girl. She's, she seems lovely for all accounts. We've had great interactions with her. We're excited about it. Um, there, he's going to take her to visit Grandma and Grandpa first, so I know it's very serious if you're going to do that. Um, so we're excited about that. But So that life complicates ministry sometimes, so that's where we go. Great question. Is there a website that we can go to? So we have prayer cards in the back, and on the back of the prayer cards, there is a website. There is a Facebook page. There is a Twitter page um, you can go to. There's links to our giving pages as such. There is my email address and my phone numbers. So we are available to be contacted by anybody ask any questions you have at that point in time. So again, please take a prayer card. Take it home with you. All the information is there. Um, so again, we, we put as many connections as we can on the prayer card so you have access to it. I'm still, yes, I'm still an associate pastor at the Bible Chapel, yes, for another, in fact, um, I was was teasing Jim, I'm going to get a text this morning, and sure enough, I got a text saying, I'm sick, can you find a sub for me? Nope, not today, I'm on vacation from that job today, so. The question is, is how long a term is theological training? In, in one sense, it never ends. I mean, you're always digging into scripture and learning more and learning more. We want to give people the tools to do that. Um, some people will take the tools and run with it a long ways and do a long time. Some will take it and be stopped where they are and just do one local or two local churches. So it varies among how much time people want to put into it. Um, and that's why I look, at, I look at it as a pyramid. You know, we want to reach the base of the pyramid. People that can't get theological education any other way and the ones that are really good at it and are motivated, they'll find a way to go to the next level and do an extended formal training and then the next level beyond that. So, um, but again, we're looking to strengthen the base. In my ministry especially is the base of the pyramid and trying to make that strong. And then the Lord will filter out the ones he needs that need more training. Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. Sir. The question is about short term. Short term trips would be about two weeks long maybe slightly longer. So um, two weeks, and let's say we're going to El Salvador. You know, If we go to El Salvador, my goal is to fly through Houston and take two days, <laughs> take a two-day layover and drive down here or fly down here and visit you guys every chance we can. That's what we talk about being connected. You know? And the more churches we have in the one place, the easier it is to come back and connect. So we want to come back often, especially in the winter, like everybody else. Any other questions? All right. Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for for, um, the body of Christ here at Redeemer and and the love they have for each other, but more importantly, the love they have for you. And just to be able to see the the love they have for each other has blessed my heart today. And and people that desire to to sit under the word and people that desire to reach the world for Christ. And Lord, I just pray we can partner together to that end. but Lord, I pray for also their ministries in this, in this area as they, as they go about their daily business, Lord. Again, there's so many chances to reach people that are lost every day. And so Lord, open our eyes and us, let us see that and be your hands and feet. So what a blessed time it's been this morning. I just pray your blessing on the rest of our day in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below.
praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. 